Uh, thank you, Joanna. Um, I had about a 40-minute presentation, so I may need to shorten it a bit, but uh, most of the stuff I am going to discuss and describe, I have papers about those, so if anyone is interested in uh, some parts, uh, please uh, drop me an email. I'm happy to share the papers. And as Joanna said, I'm happy to share the, the slides uh, for today's presentation. Uh, word of acknowledgement to the various uh, granting sources, including the UBC Hampton Funds and my many collaborators over the years. Uh, Joanna mentioned uh, her uh, days as a student in our first HCI course. Uh, Kelly Booth and I, and I think it was Ron Becker, uh, Kelly can correct me, was on sabbatical at the time. I understand Ron was here a few weeks ago giving a talk in computer science. So we, um, 1994, almost 20 years, well, 20 years, first HCI course and still going on strong. So it uh, gives me pleasure to be part of this beginning of uh, this endeavor. I'll talk to you about a special kind of HCI. Maybe it's not really special, but what I would like to do is put things into context. Uh, people here come from many different areas, could be computer science, psychology, the information school, library school, etc. And HCI is a very elastic word. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I, I've done a lot of HCI work for my PhD thesis. If you can imagine, at that time we used to look at the difference between graphics and text inf interfaces that, you know, this is going back uh, quite a number of years. Later on, when the first Mac uh, came out, I looked at the uh, efficacy of direct manipulation and iconic interfaces. It's very interesting when you look back at your research, you say today it has absolutely no relevance. But I've done quite a bit of work. When um, e-commerce started emerging, I thought this would be an ideal uh, topic to study for HCI researchers. The obvious thing is that you know, how we view the world of e-commerce or the virtual world is through information technology and therefore it's HCI. So if you look at it this way, you know, where is HCI situated in e-commerce? Well, we have uh, customers uh, at their offices, homes, wherever they are, not mobile, interacting with an online store. So part of the HCI is here. So when you look at the relationship of the interface, but in fact, the more important aspect is your communication with the company. So I'm not really that interested in classical HCI, where you are interacting with the technology, but I'm more interested in your interaction with the company through technology. So that uh, uh, brings about interesting issues. For example, how do you understand products? Uh, how do you interact with other customers? Uh, maybe some of you are studying social networks. How do you get service when you are not physically present? And how do you get advice? So when we look at a company, we're not looking at a company as a single entity, but we are saying there is a company and there are components, uh, parts of the company, be it service, be it advice, uh, products, etc., with which I'm interacting. Now, I kind of uh, found a definition of HCI on the internet from Wikipedia, and I tried to make a a little change saying that it's, the, it's not really only the interaction between people, users, and computers, but it's the interaction between consumers and online companies and parts of these particular companies. So what are some of the challenges? I think the biggest challenge is distance, and we have issues of how do you provide service, how do you understand product, how do you collaborate with other people, for example, you go to the store with your friends, you have an enjoyable experience because you are socializing and buying. How does that happen on the internet? And that brings about uh, other issues in terms of how do we evaluate interfaces. Well, typically we talk about you make uh, the person more efficient, you reduce errors, you do it faster, you are more effective. In the task you maybe enjoy, there are the hedonic uh, aspects. This is kind of general traditional HCI, but here we are also dealing with uh, improving communication between a person, a customer, and a company, building relationship, which is very important, obviously, in marketing, and the big thing in uh, all HCI studies, I guess I say all e-commerce studies and related HCI, how do you build trust? Because you are not dealing, you know, you buy a product, you have to buy it at trust, 
can I return it, etc. Now, very quickly, when you look at the consumer's perspective and goals, in HCI, uh, when we look at e-commerce, we're talking about the person is trying to buy a product, can also buy services, but we focus on the product, and we would like to have the person do this efficiently. So if it takes an hour to go to the store and back, hopefully you can do that at home in a few minutes. But at the same time, you would like to get some support from the store. Uh, that's kind of supporting the product. And then you would like to have fun as you are doing that, and you want to do some socialization as you are doing this. So kind of from the uh, consumer's perspective. If you focus a little bit more on the product itself, there are these issues of risk which come about because you have uncertainty about the products. What are these uncertainties? What's the description of the product? Uh, if you go to a store, you are touching that product on the Internet. It's more difficult. So one of the studies we've done is how do you, uh, make, uh, how do you design the interface so that the person understands and evaluates the product better? Uh, other issue is uh, how do you know the performance of the product? Uh, sometimes you are going to see these videos on the web where they show the machines working or a car you know, going in a desert or climbing up a hill. Uh, of course, product performance could also be described very simply. It's not a big deal in, in terms of HCI. It's reviews, for example. Then there's the issue of fit uncertainty. Uh, a product, uh, I could say this BMW is a great car. It really performs well, but you could say it doesn't fit my particular needs. So we are also interested in these recommendation agents with which you interact. Uh, you tell this intelligent, I shouldn't call it intelligent, but advice-giving software your needs, and then you get some advice. And that reduces the matching or the fit with your needs uncertainty. But as you are doing that, when you are telling the uh, software what product attributes you buy or you would like to buy or you would like to achieve, uh, you might misspecify. You may over-request certain things, which may cost you or may not find a product. So there is uh, something called a uh, product attribute misspecification uncertainty. The last one is the social fit uncertainty. All of these things could be fine. You get this product and then your friends say, oh, you are old fashioned, this is not good, this is, should have been a different color. So there's also the social fit issues, which uh, I guess we can solve these through uh, social networks and so on and so forth. And of course, uncertainties lead to risk and risk is not good for uh, electronic commerce because if you have uh, this uncertainty and risk, you don't want to take the risk, therefore you are not going to engage in electronic commerce. Of course, the solution to that is trust. Uh, we can build trust. Now, the overview of our research studies uh, has the consumer in the middle. So I'm really interested in the well-being of the consumer. Now, some people will say, well, you are in a business school. Aren't you also interested in the company's well-being? Well, I'm assuming that if you help the consumer, then the company will be better off uh, in the long run. So the consumer uh, interacts with products, so part of our studies deal with that. And they also interact with people, uh, which could be friends, could be other consumers, uh, could be experts, could be anyone else. And uh, consumers get advice through some software. And we, do, we did quite a bit of studies with these agents. Uh, the interesting thing about the agents is the trust issue comes, uh, uh, comes out as a very critical issue because why would you trust a piece of software? And then we have to worry about ways that uh, it, it will increase or the designers will increase the trustworthiness of this uh, advisor or agent so that you would use its uh, recommendations. And then you can think of uh, you interact with the company so that we can look at that as an entity and people like salespeople within the company. So all of these. So this is kind of an overview of what we are doing. Now, in terms of where is the HCI design here? <clears throat> well, we've looked at things like uh, avatars. Uh, I will describe the particular context later. Uh, avatars, uh, for example, we use avatars to create similarity between the consumer and the agent or the store. Uh, similarity is good because if you deal with similar people, you trust them more. You engage more with them. Uh, avatars also create a presence. Uh, it could be telepresence or social presence. You probably have studied these. And the higher presence there is, there is more trust. There is more involvement 
uh, there is more enjoyment uh, with the uh, company or the agent. We looked at things like uh, when you get the advice, uh, voice versus text, does it make a difference? Well, it makes a difference in the flow and in the, pre uh, in the social presence. Uh, video versus direct manipulation in product understanding, which one is better? I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, if you are interacting with the online company and you are asking for advice, does it matter if I tell you you are interacting with a human being on the other side of the technology or you are interacting with a piece of software? What difference does it make? Uh, explanations, which is signaling. Uh, this is not purely HCI, but it's really an interaction between an agent or an intelligent software and the user where the agent is trying to explain to you why it's behaving in a certain way, it's reasoning in a certain way, why it's asking you questions, et cetera, et cetera, and that, as uh, we'll see later, increases trust. Uh, we do simulations. Um, I have interfaces for showing the trade-offs between different product attributes. So you could say, gee, I'm, I want to buy this machine, but I want uh, a larger screen size or a memory. How much more do I have to pay? Uh, in the simulation, you will be able to do, see these things. Again, that increases your trust. And finally, we look at design as indirectly as perception. So we do uh, studies which are more, uh, they are not lab studies, they are survey studies where I say, go to these websites or tell me about a, a website you are using for e-commerce and does it have these characteristics? For example, is the interface more uh, navigable, delay, adapt adaptable, uh, less delay, and so on? And then I can see if these perceptions of the interface of the website is going to influence your interaction and future dealings with that website. So these are kind of an overview of the design characteristics. But maybe for uh, the PhD students or graduate students in this room, uh, let me tell you about where does design in my studies come? How do I know what to study in terms of design? Well, the way I approach it is this. Uh, I start with theories. I don't start with HCI theories or uh, yes? When you use the word design, are you talking about research design? No, I'm talking about the design of the interface. For example, if I have an avatar, that's a design. If I have a direct manipulation interface or video, that's a design. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, oh, okay. Uh, so uh, Kelly's question was, when I'm talking about design, what am I talking about? I'm talking about that interface design be it direct manipulation, be it uh, a graphical interface or a video interface or uh, a, a similar avatar. So, but, uh, so this is what I, so I'm not talking about, but now I'm going to talk about design in the context of my empirical studies. Where do they come, where does design come from? Well, I look at, uh, well, obviously I start with a research question. And the research question is how do I make people uh, more understanding of the product. So how, how do I make it easier for people to understand and evaluate products? Well, for, I look at, let's say, uh, the telepresence literature. They talk about vividness and interactivity uh, that creates telepresence, which means that you feel the other entity being close to you. And we use these notions to design interfaces that are vivid and interactive when you are interacting with the products. Uh, there are similarity theories, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that if that entity is similar to you, you would trust it more. So we create avatars that are front ends to these uh, intelligent software that are asking you questions, you know, the talking head. And uh, I'm saying I'm going to design it in a way that looks like you. And that's my design element versus it doesn't look like you because that comes from the similarity theories. Or from principal agent signaling, uh, I am the principle, the software is the agent, and if it signals its knowledge and its benevolence and its caring and its uh, integrity, then I'm going to trust it more. So then I take these notions of design from these theories and I do mostly a test in the lab or in an online experiment. So here is an example of the method. Uh, how do we uh, increase the trustworthiness of uh, trustworthiness of product recommendation agents. Uh, we, we look at two theories. One is signaling, the other is similarity. 
I design explanations that will signal the caring, the benevolence, and the competence of the agent. At the same time, I can put, as I said, front end a talking head as an avatar that is similar to you. Then I do some formal testing. Then I derive conclusions two ways. One is the practical advice. Yes, you should have a similar avatar. You shouldn't have one. And the second one is I support the theory or I don't support the theory. So, uh, but when I'm supporting the theory, I'm not supporting an HCI theory. I'm supporting that original theory, be it from psychology or computer science, wherever it's coming from. I hope that point is, is clear. Okay. So there are certain themes in our uh, studies. Uh, this is overall e-commerce studies. Uh, first, the company should get to know you, the customer. That's kind of uh, a critical and necessary situation for uh, customers to come to you. Then you provide advice, and, and then you provide services. So within these themes, I'm going to talk about a few uh, HCI studies we did. Uh, getting to know customers, we, we've done quite a bit of work uh, with product recommendation agents. Uh, I don't know if uh, probably some of you have used these, maybe all of you, where uh, depending on the advisor, it will ask you questions about the characteristics of the product. Here is an example. Uh, this is what it says. Uh, you will enter your preferences and you will get recommendations. So here's an example of an attribute preference elicitation where you are indicating how much you want to spend on this particular machine. Later, there are going to be a number of other questions uh, depending on the product. It could be the resolution, it could be the zoom, it could be the size, etc., etc. And then you indicate the importance and at the end you get a bunch of recommendations which are uh, listed in terms of uh, the fit. Uh, at this point, you could take, accept one of these recommendations, go and buy it, or, or if you want, do nothing. The other thing you can do is you can look at these cameras and you can say, well, none of these things are really what I wanted. You go back and you can change your preferences. So this is the nature of these recommendation agents. A big thing here is, of course, how do I trust this? Now, some of the designs we tested um, had to do with illustrating trade-offs. Uh, we had communication modes, how does the uh, avatar or uh, the intelligent agent uh, communicate with you, and who delivers the advice. Uh, unfortunately, I had a dynamic version of it. Doesn't seem to be working. So I'll, I'll describe what we are doing here. These are the characteristics of, in this case, we are talking about a laptop, and the issue here is, what are the relationships between these particular attributes? If I want more processor power, more memory, et cetera, what will happen? So what you do is you, you move these sliders back and forth, and you will see price moving. Uh, so that's the simplest version. In another version where you move one thing, two things will move. And in the highest version, when you move one thing, three things, three related things will move. And what we find is that, is that uh, this uh, follows an inverse U curve. At the very lowest level, where you only change one thing, you get some understanding. At the middle level, you get a higher understanding. When you provide too many relationships, cognitive load kicks in. And basically, what you will find is that people understand the product less. So this is an example of the interface we use to make people understand the trade-offs, which I indicated was one of the challenges uh, when you are using recommendation agents. Uh, the other one was dealing with um, uh, should you have voice or avatar interfaces, going back to maybe uh, about 12 years where the, the type of avatars we used to have looked like the son of Frankenstein, but uh, things have improved. But even with these very crude interfaces, so more recently we are using uh, faces and avatars that look much better, uh, what you find is that providing human voice and providing an avatar in the interface improves the social presence, uh, the communication is warmer, richer, uh, in, improves the telepresence, you feel uh, the, that advice giver being closer to you, and more importantly, it uh, improves the trust. Uh, another study was uh, when you are giving advice, uh, is it better to tell people, now what you are doing is you are keying in your answers, and what you are getting is textual responses back. So you don't know who is on the other side. But in one case, we tell people that there is a human being 
who is communicating with you. In the other case, we say that all your uh, uh, desires or needs and so on is going to a software which is going to give you feedback. In both cases, uh, the software-based system, in other words, the human is still using the same system to take your answers, but at the interface level, what happens is when you deal with a human being, or if you think that you are dealing with a human being, you think that the products are more personalized for your needs. And what happens is higher personalization will lead to higher trust, and therefore more likelihood that you will accept the advice. If you think that you are dealing with software, then you think it's more efficient, but less personalized. Um, the next category was trying to help customer understand their own needs. One of the things we did here was um, product uh, understanding. Uh, we had a relatively simple study uh, in one version. So here uh, we have kind of a personal advisor, and there are different functionalities. You can add an address, you can edit it, you can search for uh, someone's address and phone number, etc. And we had three treatments. One was a very, what we call the static interface. You would see the pictures and you'll see a bunch of descriptions of what this uh, functionality was. In the other one, we used a video. Uh, so there would be a video narration of how these things would, would work. In the third one, we, we had a, what we call a direct manipulation, not too sophisticated, but we told people to actually do this uh, using the, the screen interface. So the issue is, which one do you think led to a higher product understanding? The video, the static, the video, or the direct manipulation? Excuse me? Why video? <laughs> well, in fact, you will see most of the uh, most of the web interfaces, or if, if you uh, go to e-commerce sites, you'll see video. Video obviously is, is more um, versatile. But what happens is that people who use the direct manipulation, in terms of perceptions, they think that they more. In the same uh, study, we also had objective questions where we said how would you do this, and, and so on and so forth. When we dealt with product with fewer attributes, let's say less complex or simpler products, direct manipulation worked very nicely. And in fact, in terms of objective understanding, it was better. But uh, when the product had too many features and characteristics, at that point, direct manipulation wasn't as effective and video was. The difference is that in direct manipulation, you have to do work as the user, whereas in video, Everything is passive. Therefore, depending on the complexity, it could be direct manipulation or it could be video. Um, oops, sorry, no, sorry. Go back here. Uh, I was going to talk very quickly. I don't know if you've seen uh, these kinds of interfaces where you put on the clothes on your, you know, there's male and female dummies. You can change their features. Uh, I just wanted to... Uh, to mention one of the studies by uh, a doctoral student of mine. This wasn't my study. He did it for his, uh, Honky Kim is his name, for his master's thesis, where they find that the more that avatar looks like you, in fact, they would create avatars exactly looking like you, the more likely it's that you would trust uh, the quality of the product and, and buy that. So this is kind of an example of similarity in the interface. Uh, there's a little video here. I don't have time to show it. Uh, uh, if you get the slides, you can try that. It's quite nice. Uh, one of the interesting studies we did was in, in generating advice, we tried to create this notion of similarity, which I mentioned several times. Uh, this is based on this um, computers are social actors paradigm from Reeves and Nass. They have a, an interesting book, I think published about 10, 15 years ago, called The Media Equation. And th their claim is that your interaction with computers are as though you are dealing with a social entity. So we start with that notion, and then we try to create three different types of similarity. One was uh, personality similarity. Using speech act theory, we created interfaces or agents when they talked to you or they interacted with you, uh, they sounded either dominant or submissive. And what we tried to see is that if you, the individual, the user was dominant or submissive versus what the agent was, 
And if there was a similarity, would that make any difference? We found very weak effects on trustworthiness, on that uh, personality similarity. We had another one, which is called the choice strategy. In other words, given the information, given your needs, how does the agent come up with a product? Uh, so I choose a product. I have a way of thinking. Then the agent tells me this is the product, and then it tells me how it went about reasoning about choosing that product. What we find is if there is similarity in the way I do it, let's say I use an elimination strategy where I say I don't want to pay more than this or I don't want to get less than that, and if the agent uses the same kind of thinking, then there is a very strong effect on trust and usefulness and enjoyment. So on uh, choice strategy similarity, there was quite an effect. The last one we did is demographic, sim uh, demographic similarity. I always get nervous when I talk about this for obvious reasons. This is what we did. We said, um, let's um, have four different types of faces. These are the talking faces as you've seen before on the interfaces. Asian male, Asian female, Caucasian male, Caucasian female. And what happens if the user, user's gender and ethnicity matches? Does it make any difference? So, um, and then, of course, in the interface, we changed uh, the interface depending on the treatment the person was in. And uh, we found some interesting results. But before I do that, the results were a bit surprising. I'm not going to mention what they were. But we did, uh, for those of you who are interested in, now, Johanna is interested. <laughs> increasing, increasing suspense is called this. Uh, we also did fMRI studies. I'm not an fMRI expert. Uh, I have two colleagues from Temple University. And the way you do fMRI experiments versus the way you do a standard lab experiment is totally different in all aspects. Again, I'm happy to share this paper, but as you can see, in the fMRI interface, and some of you might have done these studies. You are seeing everything to these goggles, and then you have a, a clicker and so on. So the question is, do you think similarity in demographic, in terms of gender and ethnicity, made a difference or not? In terms of, let's say, your trust in that advice that uh, you get from the agent. Tough question. The uh, short answer I'll give you is that, yes, it made a difference. It made a difference for females only, not for males. And there are reasons that uh, females are more interested in the social aspects, et cetera, et cetera. But this is an example of the similarity studies uh, we've done. Again, I'm happy to share the, the papers with you. Um, then we uh, did some uh, protocol tracing or process tracing studies, uh, trying to understand trust. Uh, so what's the relationship between trust and the interface? I mean, there are many reasons for why people trust an agent. One of them is explanations. The more you explain, the more you share information about what you are doing as an agent, the more trust. But the last two in red, uh, quality, the better the quality of the interfaces, the more people trusted the agent. And the more you had control over the interface, the more you trusted the agent, among other things, even though the last two were not the really uh, dominant reasons for trusting. But there was an element of HCI which was uh, involved in the trusting. And lastly, I'll talk about providing services. Um, we uh, look at service delivery, and I'll describe what service is, in two ways. Um, one is the content of the service. So if I give you advice, that's service. If I tell you that the product, I'm tracking the product, that is service. If I, after you buy the product, if I tell you how to use it better, that's kind of service. So that's the content of the service, which is different than the delivery. Delivery is just the HCI part. So if you look at the delivery, uh, people look, uh, people in marketing use something called serve quality or service quality where they look at things like, uh, is it delivered with empathy and responsiveness and so on. The studies we did, we looked at the more kind of standard HCI issues. Uh, is the interface accessible from different uh, platforms? Can you navigate? Can you adapt the interface? Is low delay, high security, et cetera. Uh, when you look at the service content, uh, the content are things like, uh, 
what do I need, where is the source, how do I pay for it, et cetera, et cetera. And what we find is that, again, the HCI part here is the notion that both content of what you are providing as service and delivery are important. Uh, when we do a study in the context of electronic government, for example, we find that service delivery quality and service content quality have an equal impact on overall satisfaction with uh, the e-government website. And lastly, we did a study on uh, collaborative shopping, sorry, where we had two people in different places shopping on the, fir uh, on the same uh, website. And this was a long time ago and the interfaces were crude, but we had two options. One option was uh, at all times, you and I, the two friends who are shopping, let's say you are in Singapore, I'm here, we always see the same screen. In the other case, we see different screens, but we have to tell each other if we are moving from one to the other. Uh, impressions, the perceptions were such that people like to have always the same screen, but there were complaints about what happens is that when we are looking at the same screen, if I move to another screen, you also move. So we are kind of tied together uh, with handcuffs, and that was the downside of it. But there are much better interfaces today in terms of doing collaborative shopping. So just to summarize, uh, in our HCI studies, we looked at product understanding. We looked at uh, different ways of communicating. Uh, we find that this increases uh, presence and trust. Uh, we dealt with showing trade-offs when you are dealing with re recommendation agents. We designed for similarity. Uh, which helped in some cases, explaining behavior of the agent uh, to the user was helpful, uh, distinguish between delivery, which is the more HCI part, from the content in service. We found that both of them have equal impact. And in terms of HCI and trust, we find things like having control over the interface, uh, the ease of use, and the similarity of the interface to you are things that increase uh, trust. So I'll stop with that, and I'll answer your questions. If you run the mic around, it might be easier. <laughs> so one of the stories that's just come out the last couple of days is the, the Big Eight, which is, I guess, Microsoft, Google, and six others, has written an open letter to the U.S. government and potentially all other governments about sort of uh, staying out of the, the spying surveillance business. And it's not too hard. I mean, even in their statement, I think they, they said there's a lot of vested self-interest in it. So I was wondering if you could relate that to the issue of trust, uh, how much uh, of, of um, what your research has found do, do, are people relying on things like privacy and, and security? And maybe as a second one, wh whether you see this as uh, an example of which we don't see many, where industry in some sense is standing up to governments and actually protecting people's rights more than the government is, which is my opinion about what's going on, but I've been interested in yours. Uh, I mean, as you can see, Kelly, very, very little of what I'm doing here has uh, any relationship to the bigger issues you are discussing. If there is anything that relates, it's uh, when you use these agents, you are revealing your uh, preferences to the agents. So you could say from a marketing point of view, in electronic commerce, uh, the companies and people who are looking into what the companies are doing are collecting and tracking a lot of information about your preferences. But kind of the products we are looking at are, I would say, innocent products. I don't think, I mean, there could be some privacy issues in the sense that if you get a letter saying, well, we understand you like such and such product, you might be irritated, but it doesn't bring it up to the level of the, the bigger headaches that uh, we are talking about in, in the issues you, you alluded to. I, I'm doing from, from the high school here. Um, you said earlier in your talk that the theories that you use in your research are not HCI theories, and I, I felt that you really put an emphasis, emphasis on that. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Is that 
there aren't ACI theories that are useful, or would you want to encourage students to do that kind of importing of theory into HCI? What, what, what's your perspective on that? I guess the point I was trying to make is that uh, I'm coming from a business school, you are from the high school. We, we have a, a context, an audience. The audience I'm, I'm dealing with is, as I said, increasing the, the welfare of the co uh, consumers. And I'm trying to understand, uh, when I start with a question, let's say product understanding. Now this could be an example in which HCI, HCI theories may apply, because let's say you start talking about cognitive load issues. Uh, so when you uh, try to do product understanding, it's direct manipulation, the product is too complex, then you get a cognitive load, so you get into the video. The, the interface I showed with understanding of trade-offs, again, where you show too many trade-offs at the same time, again, cognitive load issues will become. So maybe, maybe I exaggerated, but the point I was trying to make is that when I have a question, uh, it may not even be an, an HCI question, but I start with the question, I'm trying to find, let's say, similarity theory is a good example, where I don't think it's a, maybe it's an HCI theory, I don't think so, but I use that notion to say that I'm going to design these talking heads in different ways, and therefore, I don't think it's related to HCI. Nonetheless, the research looks like HCI research, so that, that's the point I was, so maybe I, I overdid that I'm not relating on HCI. Of course I am in certain cases. So I have a question about the recommendation aspect of your work. Um, so my impression is that uh, people often buy products that don't really need them. So, Maybe a, a good uh, advice for consumers is would be often to say, "Well, you don't really need this." So <laughs> I'm just wondering if you have done any work on uh, really helping user at this level, or if there is any work done and similar theories or uh, system could be used for that. I guess. Uh coming from a business school, you don't need a product, it's kind of foreign notion to us. No. <laughs> yeah. Right. In, in, uh, in our original studies with these advice giving systems, we said we want to increase trust on the part of, uh, of the user. And there are three, uh, three aspects or three antecedents to trust is, um, uh, competence, benevolence, uh, and integrity. And we had one explanation where the agent explained its reasoning that dealt in improving competence perceptions. Uh, another one, it explained why it was asking you certain, you know, I'm asking you, uh, you know, if you are traveling a lot. And the person, why are you asking? Well, maybe I'll get you a lighter camera. And the third one was what we called a trade-off, not similar to the one I showed, but a different kind where we said, Look, be careful, you seem to be asking for too much. In other words, if you want all of these nice features, you are going to pay a lot of money, and then you are not going to find too many cameras with those characteristics. And when we did that, people thought the agent had higher honesty or integrity. So that's the only directly, I could say, don't buy notion comes from giving you advice of not overdoing it. Because the tendency of people is, why shouldn't I ask for everything? And at the end, you may get a product that you don't uh, necessarily need. So that's the only direct answer I can have for you on that. So um, I, I wanted to ask you, we're moving into the era of personalized medicine. And um, a lot of that is, is going to be conducted through interfaces. So I wonder what your thoughts are, if you've reflected at all on how the findings from your research, which is in the context of the business domain, might transport or be applicable in the area, in the area of personalized medicine. I, uh, Victoria, I haven't dealt with that topic, and I, I find it, uh, I mean, buying products and personalized medicine, I think the context is so different uh, that both the legal issues on the part of uh, the physicians, and uh, in terms of your trusting uh, 
you know, a piece of software for medical advice. I would be leery. I personally would be leery of that. I'm sure there are a lot of studies. Unfortunately, I haven't, I have very little knowledge on, on that. I mean, personalization, um, I presume what a physician is doing in asking you questions is, is a kind of personalization, but I am out of my depth here, so I better skip that question. Control aspect. So you mentioned that um, interaction with the provider of the user with greater sense of control led to greater trust. And I'm assuming also that higher trust also meant more purchasing or something like that, something that was good for the company. But so what act what were the aspects of control of the interaction that were investigated? Well, control of the interaction would mean as uh, for example, we've done certain studies where do you want the, the software to ask you a preset, uh, uh, a bunch of questions that are predefined in advance? It's about certain characteristics of the product. Or do you want to say, uh, I want to tell you about the size of the camera I want. Or next, I want to tell you about the color of the camera. Whereas having these predetermined questions, so is this tight guidance or loose kind of control? So the more control you have, in guiding what uh, questions you want to answer, what uh, attributes you want to specify, the more trust you have. Yes. Okay. In terms of my own little feedback, back to Luann's question about the HCI and HCI theories, I think it in part depends, and we're having this debate uh, online, thank you to the blog posters, but what does it mean to be HCI? And I think in part, um, the term HCI has broadened substantially in terms of what what it covers. And I know, Isaac, you mentioned um, at one point in your talk, oh, this isn't classic HCI. And so I think, you know, there is this notion of what classic HCI is, is back, you know, 25 years ago in the psychology computer science um, kind of dyad there. And uh, today it's a much, much broader umbrella, despite the fact that we've kept um, the same title. So I don't know if that's something you would agree with or not. Well, I guess the, I don't know. I use the word classic, maybe without thinking about the definition, but I was saying that it's one person interacting with a technology versus a person interacting with other entities through technology. And this is a good example of that. So you are interacting with a technology, but at the same time you are interacting with a company, with people in the company, with other people, other customers, other products. So how do we, can we, should we differentiate between that direct immediate interface versus the interface to the other entity via technology and does that make any difference in the research we are doing or in the philosophies or the, the theories we are using? I think that's a great point. So there's lots of research going on in the HCI community that is about computer mediated communication. So, it's, so in your case it's the, the, um, the user, the consumer interacting with the company and it's mediated through right. technology. There's lots of research going on um, that, that is analogous in the sense that it's, it's users interacting with other users and it's mediated through technology. But they're not there to use the technology, they're there to interact with users at the other end. And so some theories there um, might, might also apply. But yet, if that immediate interaction is poor or lousy, then the eventual interaction fails. So it's, it's almost like a necessary but not sufficient to be successful in interacting with the other party. So the first step has to be that of high quality, and then you worry about the second step. Absolutely. If, yeah. if the system, in terms of that inter interaction level, is not usable, right. then the mediation to the others will not be uh, fruitful. So I wanted to follow up on that, this distinction between sort of the, what we might think of as the direct interaction between the user and the interface and this mediated communication. And one of the things you noted, and I didn't mention too much about, was collaborative shopping. So my favorite example of a, a company that doesn't get it is Translink. So in Translink, if I invite you over for dinner and you're going to take transit, I'm kind of an expert on where I live. So I can navigate the Translink site pretty quickly and find the route, best route for you or the set of routes. And after I've done all that work, which takes a while, I can't send it to you because they're one of these terrible websites that only has one URL. And it seems to me that that's 
quite possibly a growing kind of concern that people are going to have where you're buying it, but I may be the expert who's going to help you on it. And if we can't share the website somehow, um, of course, we could use collaborative. But is that a, do you see this idea, or what is your definition of collaborative shopping? Does it include that kind of? No, I think that's a, it could be computer supported co cooperative work or any kind of task that's being handled by multiple parties through uh, computer mediated work. I mean, that work has been going for a long time. So, so you would advocate that I should be using a collaboration tool as screen sharing, for example? Well, I mean, this very specific case, you would like to, uh, there was an article was yesterday in the New York Times, quite interesting. Uh, I'll send you a copy, Kelly, where they were talking about what are the skills now we have to, uh, we should have in the age of the very intelligent machine. So they were saying, well, the computer is doing a lot of the stuff for you, uh, like translate, let's say. But the human still has a, that expertise over and above. And you mentioned you have the local expertise. So that, that brings an interesting issue of uh, what do we have to know, how do we have to train people so that they can beat the machine? Because if the machine takes over, then we are going to be in trouble. But I think the, the example you are talking about is a very interesting case in which the interface is lousy, yeah. right? Because I think it's, I mean, in this case, all I want to do is generate, which Google Search will do for you, or Google Maps. You can click on a button that says, give me a URL which will get this map and this, this routing that I found. So in fact, I assume most people do this now. Nobody goes to Translate, you go to Google because it does a better job, even though it's a general purpose tool. But all the other possibilities, such as if we move to a screen sharing tool, then you and I have to be co-present. Right. Or I could send you some script sort of thing, but then you have to trust both me and the script that there's not going to be some secret command in there. So it gets very complex. And something as simple as sending a URL would seem to be the, the solution. Yeah, well, in, in the example that you mentioned, one solution would be could invite me and say, I'm going to... Uh, find the, the best way to get from your place to mine. And as I'm doing it, why don't you watch what I'm doing and you can learn that. That would have been easy. Okay, we're going to give Leanne the last question. We're going to connect with the power. Um, Leanne, you have a question for Kelly. Yeah, I'm going to connect with the power. Thank you. Um, it was a very fascinating uh, talk. I'm actually, uh, I do health informatics. And so to somewhat respond to Vicky's question, the, um, and to, can further ask you a question. Uh, there's lots of people that are looking at, I think it's what you were calling similarity theory, theory, where you've got the avatars. So in the context of smoking cessation, people are building websites for quitting smoking, and they're really focusing on having that avatar look like the person. It's very consistent. And we're, we're actually calling it uh, consumer informatics. So this type of health um, self-management <clears throat> and I wonder um, if if we're thinking is do you think that the consumer is doing the same sort of shopping behavior when they're looking in, in health and I know you already said that you don't you feel like it's out of your scope but I think that what other things might be translatable into the kind of shopping around in health I think the dangerous thing is that uh, we probably know more about products in general than we know about medical diagnostic. Uh, so you could say that in the case of products, maybe getting more information is, is better. And some of our studies, you know, I talk quite a bit about agents, but we have studies where we say, here is the advice from the agent, here is from the experts, here are from other consumers. So we try to bring other viewpoints. But the, the problem, I think, with medical, uh, the medical situation is we don't know ourselves, the average person, as much about medicine as we know about products. So I think there's a lot of danger of not understanding. I mean, the more you shop, it, it, I mean, the, the more you look for information, typically in information theory, it will say the more information you have, the better. And in this case, you might be worse off because you are going to get confused. Uh, that's a hypothesis that could be tested. I'd like to thank Zach um, for a great